Hi, I'm Ralph Preston, and Tuesdays we have these recovery and science support group meetings. And today we're going to talk with Dr. Brent Calhoun, who is a veterinarian who was forced into retirement, uh, like a lot of us were, by our strokes. And uh, Brett, unfortunately, suffered also from aphasia as a part of his stroke and as a part of his stroke recovery, overcame aphasia. Pretty well, I would say, and so we'll let him do his uh, the talking rather than me. So, Brent, tell us a little bit about uh, when you. I, I know it was in 2010. I know you started helping people in 2021. Tell us a little bit about your stroke and that whole journey of uh, recovery, if you would. Well, thank you, Ralph, and uh, hello, everybody, and uh, um, I'm excited to be here. Um, uh, it's like a, a path we're all on. And uh, my path um, uh, was uh, taken, uh, uh, was on, I was um, around, I was 50 years age, uh, young, and, um, um, and I didn't realize uh, I had the first stroke. Um, um, I, um, the first stroke took out my speech center. And the second stroke, two days later, took out my uh, uh, right um, um, motion of my body. So basically, um, and uh, two days after uh, it all started, I went from a normal, well, I say normal, I wasn't normal, but uh, uh, people maybe would call me normal. But uh, I was walking, talking. Um, my job was I was the hospital administrator of a large uh, specialty and emergency veterinary hospital in uh, Michigan. And um, and uh, then three days later, I'm uh, bedridden and I cannot talk. And um, it was a, a crazy thing because I and my wife, my wife is, a, uh, an, she was an advertising producer, uh, advertising agency producer, which means she, had projects that she made sure uh, they happened on time and under budget. But um, she went crazy too, because I had two strokes um, uh, two days apart, and we still didn't know why uh, they happened. And um, so basically, um, it, uh, six days after the first happened, which happened when I was asleep, the only um, I don't, or the only issue that I had uh, of a, a, a hint or a clue uh, was the morning after the first happened, I was getting ready for work and I fell, which is really odd. Right? But uh, being a good veterinarian, I popped up and I continued uh, 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 doing the rest of my, um, um, my uh, duties. But uh, the only thing that was really odd is um, 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 I didn't think about uh, the fact that my speech started uh, deteriorating through the day. And, um, um, but um, um, th that night uh, when uh, my wife was, uh, well, <laughs> what happened was we uh, went to uh, have a uh, recital for one of our boys and, uh, I didn't talk much there either. And uh, I told my wife, or maybe I somehow I communicated to her that I was gonna stop, um, I was gonna go home and uh, she was gonna take the, our two sons to the ice cream store. And, um, but I decided um, I had a really bad headache and I used, I used to get migraines about three to five days uh, in a stretch. And um, so I figured I better uh, stop at the library and get some DVDs because uh, I may still need to, uh, uh, I may need to stay home uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow. And, uh, <laughs> and then uh, I knew I had the problem. The first uh, hint 
or the um the first uh, clue uh, that uh, was apparent to me was my wife got home before I did, um, and she called me on my cell phone and she said, "Where are you?" And I couldn't answer her, and I knew I had some problems. And uh, uh, but being a producer, she went into twenty questions and she started asking, "Are you at uh, the grocery store?" The, Blah, blah, blah. And she finally said library. And I still could say yes or no. And I said yes. And she said, well, come on home and we'll figure it out. And if, if I would have known that I had a stroke already, I, I don't think I would have got into the car again. I would have called 911. But um, being a dumb uh, guy, uh, I went home and uh, basically she convinced me that I needed to go to the hospital, which I agreed. And um, uh, three hours later, the emergency doctor came in, uh, came uh, into my cubicle and told me, you had a stroke. And I thought he had made a mistake and he had switched my chart with somebody else's because I'm, uh, uh, I'm um, too young to have a stroke. And um, um, slowly over the... Um, next few days, I realized that it can happen to everyone or anyone. Okay. And tell us a little bit about your recovery. Well, um, uh, it was uh, really fascinating. Uh, um, I assumed that I was going to get back and get my uh, job uh, uh, in the, uh, um, at the hospital I was. And um, I just went into overdrive, so to speak, and I focused on uh, uh, recovery. And I, I thought recovery encompassed my physical dimension or physical arena, but um, I've since learned that uh, recovery uh, uh, covers a whole spectrum of, uh, of uh, our life. And, um, but I focused um, on uh, getting uh, doing the transfer from my bed to the wheelchair. And I would always, I, I was um, in the hospital almost six weeks, and I would always, uh, uh, at least uh, every day, I would uh, take one or two or three uh, rolls around the hospital with my wheelchair. And then slowly, I, um, I was, uh, with the rehab I was getting at the hospital, I was getting physical therapy, occupational therapy and uh, speech therapy. And I was uh, making some progress and I got to, um, so that I got a walker. Um, I wasn't allowed uh, to have the walker uh, unsupervised, but I was still uh, going to, because uh, I just kept focusing on getting back to my job. And then okay. after uh, I was okay. in the um, uh, hospital almost six weeks, then I was in a rehab place for three weeks. And slowly I started to uh, improve, um, but I didn't realize um, um, how big a, a mountain was uh, ahead of me. So um, uh, th then after uh, uh, the rehab hospital, I... Uh, I had uh, almost five months of uh, outpatient uh, rehab, which was physical, uh, occupational, and uh, speech therapy. And um, I remember when the um, speech therapist uh, um, discharged me, um, she just said, you know, the best thing you can do is just go out and live and talk with everyone. And um, I um, heard her but I didn't really get it in my soul. Um, and uh, for the next 10 years, I uh, really was lost. Um, because when I was, a, 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 when I was uh, employed as the hospital minister, administrator, I knew that my job, my calling, was to help pet owners get help for their pets that they thought... Uh, they, um, their regular veterinarian thought uh, it was uh, uh, past uh, help. And uh, our doctors could help them. And, um, and so I would go out and talk uh, 
with everybody about what we can do. And that was uh, when um, back then uh, uh, specialists were uh, unusual for, for animals. And um, so, um, but uh, almost uh, the next 11 years of my life when I had the strokes, um, I was um, lost. I didn't realize what I could do, but I realized I could uh, help others and um, in 2021, I went to a seminar and I realized, oh, I can do, I can help other stroke survivors uh, with uh, their um, condition as they recover. So that's what I've been doing ever since. Wonderful, you, sir. Wonderful. Do you um, uh, help people with uh, mostly with aphasia or? No, um, um, I do the, uh, it helps uh, uh, since I had uh, two strokes, uh, one takes out the speech center, the second uh, takes out, out the um, uh, the motor function, but it it it, uh, it uh, affected more. For example, um, I uh, have what's called emotionalism or uh, emotional liability or liable. Um, basically, I would cry. I would laugh or I would be mad without any apparent reason. And uh, that used to annoy my sons <laughs> because they would have, be over in their, with their friends and I would just start laughing. Or I, I usually I could control uh, the angry outburst or crying outburst from them, but uh, I would start laughing and my sons would go, what's funny? <laughs> and I say, Oh, I know, no. So I, I had um, I had to deal with that at least five years. Um, uh, I didn't realize uh, until uh, um, I started learning uh, more about the stroke and uh, the rehab, uh, the recovery, and all we can deal with. And um, it was um, it's both fascinating and scary. I had something similar. I. I found myself laughing when no one else was laughing and also found uh, uh, sometimes somebody would say something funny that everybody else thought was funny. And I went, I don't get it. Wasn't funny at all to me. It, uh, it, our brains go through some changes. Uh, uh, some people get diagnosed with pseudobulbar effect. Those are kind of the some of the symptoms of it, whether you have it or not doesn't matter they didn't they didn't have it um well they, it wasn't promoted a whole lot when i had my stroke because they didn't have a medicine for it yet that they could sell you and now they do so it's um it, it's a it's a bigger um issue the mind um, kind of went away on its own after six months or so awesome um it's interesting um um i guess i'm a, a little uh a rogue uh person and i have uh, watched uh, the um, um, the popularity of the diagnosis of a pseudobulbar uh, uh, effect and uh, disorder, or whatever they call it, and uh, the uh, emotionalism takes a lot of uh, names. Uh, uh, but um, um, they, when they found that they could uh, medicate uh, some uh, with uh, with uh, uh, um, drug that a, a pharmaceutical could uh, um, patent it, then it made it more uh, interesting to hear about it. So I don't know if it's as a real uh, issue or the medicine really helps. Uh, I just think it helped enough that uh, it was uh, approved by the FDA. I haven't heard a lot of feedback about that. People often post that they're, you know, having uncontrolled emotions and, and laughter and crying. And uh, I bring up, bring it up, but I don't hear a lot of people say, I tried the medicine and it worked, or I tried the medicine and it didn't work. A lot of my knowledge is based on what I see in the groups. It's anecdotal, but, uh, you know, as any, as a doctor knows, if you see a whole bunch of labs that uh, have the same thing, all of a sudden you've got some, anecdotal information that's actually pretty 
much science, isn't it? So yes. I try and conglomerate things. I don't know much about, uh, about, I haven't heard much about whether that medicine's effective in uh, our stroke community or, or not. I, I do know when I post that, a lot of people, other people come on and go, oh, wow, that's what, that's, I've, that's what's going on with me too. Yeah. So you were saying you just kind of lived life for five for 10 years and they told you the best therapy was what, what, what we call functional therapy, just talk and, and, and use. Did you do anything special or did you just pretty much, uh, cause you're doing pretty well. Uh, well, um, the issue I, um, I, I found, um, it's interesting. I thought aphasia happened uh, uh, when you had a stroke, but I've learned since then it's uh, uh, you can get aphasia for so many reasons. In fact, I think uh, stro strokes account for about uh, uh, studies show anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of patients that have a stroke will have the aphasia and uh, the rest uh, they can get a head injury. Uh, brain tumors, um, neurodegenerative diseases, and infections. And uh, I found that uh, that was pretty fascinating when I learned about it, that there's a lot of uh, people out there with aphasia um, that uh, didn't have a stroke. So that was uh, news to me early on I had to learn. And the other thing that was really fascinating is most people don't know what aphasia is. And so I've started saying I have a speech difficulty because I have what's called expressive aphasia, which means when I know what I want to say, I can't say it. I can't say it. And, um, and when I get excited or uh, mad or nervous, I have more difficulty. Like uh, you probably didn't tell in the beginning, I was exci really excited and I had uh, difficulty finding some of the words. And um, I have also has started to uh, um, started to say that I have an accent. And I say, um, um, people laugh uh, when I explain, um, I have an accent compared to what I used to talk uh, before I had the strokes. That's interesting. That happens to a few people. I have a friend who was born in Germany, and he came over at 18 to go to college, had a stroke at 43, and he, uh, I didn't know him before his stroke, uh, I met him shortly after, but he uh, insisted that he had sounded like an American, he completely got rid of his um, German accent, and after he had his stroke, he has a, th uh, a thick German accent, and he can't seem to get rid of it. And uh -huh. I got to think uh, Dr. Hetzler might have some thoughts on this. I got to think like somehow the stroke had him reconnect with uh, the eight year old boy in him or what, whatever, wherever that language, uh, you know, came from. I've, I've heard a couple of other people who had either accents or altered speech as a, as a, as a result of having a stroke. So, that's I can't fantastic. comment on that. I'm not quite sure there. When you have the expressive aphasia, it generally results from damage in the left frontal cortex in Broca's area. Yeah. And uh, there's also, of course, receptive aphasia, where you have difficulty understanding the speech of others. And that results from damage in the temporal lobe in, in Wernicke's area. So, and then there's Alexia with agraphia. You can't read and you can't write. That's from damage to the lang to the angular gyrus in the left hemisphere. So there are a number of different types of aphasia, but the one that most people are aware of is the expressive one, the, the Broca's aphasia. And I'm not a therapist, of course, but there is a relatively new treatment for that. I think I mentioned that to you, Ralph. Uh, it was uh, based on a study performed in Finland, I guess about five years ago or so, in which uh, uh, there were three groups of recent aphasia patients that were divided into three groups. 
one listen to uh, vocal music singing, basically, another instrumental music, and another basically books on tape. And the group that listened to the singing in the genre that they liked, whatever it was, country, western, uh, pop, uh, opera, whatever, for an hour a day for like two months, compared to the other two groups, did much better in terms of their improvement in the ability to talk. And they had improved connections in their left frontal cortex. Fascinating. Uh, music opens up the brain like nothing else. and But it's interesting because the second, uh, one of the three groups also listened to music, but not singing. So there has to be an ex extra component to um, singing, perhaps in terms of aphasia, um, you know, we've had Brian Harris from Bed Rhythms, and they use music to help people with gait. So sure. that's a, the mobility side of it there. And I don't know that anybody's ever studied. Of course, I walk mostly to Motown because they had them when I tested their product because I like the I like the beat, and I grew up on Motown too, so I knew all the songs and all the words. But it'd be interesting to do a study. I, I would have to think that there would be less of an effect with singing on physical side as there would be on language, but that's a that's not even a scientific wild guess. It's a total conjecture. Um, Bruce, uh, um, did you know um, if uh, on the study the, a group that uh, heard uh, the music with words did they sing along with it or? No, they did not. They just heard it. Interesting. And uh, hearing it improved their ability to talk and, again, improved the axonal pathways in their left frontal brain, left frontal cortex. So it, wow. it's a fascinating study. And, uh, again, I'm not a therapist, but from my perspective, that's sort of the gold standard now uh, because it's relatively inexpensive to do, and the results were very impressive. Other therapies uh, involve um, basically singing your answer to a question and then gradually moving from singing to talking. I, I've heard of that before as, as a therapy. And then the other one is uh, constraint-induced speech therapy, which is a modification of constraint-induced movement therapy, where basically, if, if you can't talk, you aren't allowed to point or nod your head or shake your head. Yeah. You, you're sort of forced to talk. <laughs> wow. That's your question. It, two things I I know two different people that um, are in their recovery the, the relevant here. One, well, we had Dr. Robin Smith on one time. I went back to his, um, uh, he had a Tuesday uh, afternoon, Tuesday and Thursday afternoon stroke group um, in inside the rehab hospital I was in. And I attended it every time as soon as I found, well, I found out about it right away because uh, well, when you're in the rehab hospital, you're looking for as much as you can do so you don't have to stare at Oprah on the television. Anyway, there was a guy there who was a minister, and he had never much sung in his life before. And he could sing any almost any hymn, hymn in perfect pitch, and he couldn't say a word. Wow. So I thought that was, I, have, I don't know what conclusions to draw from that, but I found that really interesting. And then I had a local friend that I helped um, who had a TBI. She got run down by a car and injured on, in, uh, I'm not sure, obviously on the left, because she had, I would say, expressive aphasia. She couldn't talk or find her words. And one of the things, first steps for her in, in her recovery was her sister started playing when they would ride around to doctor's appointments and therapy appointments, her sister would put on her favorite songs on the radio. 
Mm -hmm. the first, I mean, on the, however they did it, CDs, tapes, uh, satellite radio. And what she, and started trying to encourage her to sing along. She would sing along and try and get her sister to. And slowly her sister started singing along to the choruses, mouthing a few words of the choruses, singing the choruses. So singing is a really um, powerful thing. I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of, that could be done, more that could be done with it. In fact, be interesting to see what Brian Harris and the gang at Med Rhythms do uh, now that they have their gate product out on the market. Well, it's newly on the market, so they're probably still so slammed, but they did a lot of work. Um, in the early days, they did some work with aphasia, and they um, may still be doing it. I'm thinking about um, Brian, uh, the CEO, who used to, uh, he was at Spalding, uh, clinic in Boston, one of the best in the country, and he would do th well. He'd use his guitar. I got two visions of him there, and one is him walking backwards down the hall with a gate patient playing the guitar, and the other is with this guy about our age, and he would play the guitar, simple songs, you know, "You Are My Sunshine," stuff like that, and he would get the guy to interact with him uh through the music so it's it's some kind of bridge and i would say it needs more exploration uh especially if the fins have figured out that uh it's it's effective hopefully somebody's taken that study and and tried to do some uh other you know blind studies uh, around the whole thing and uh figure it out science is a wonderful thing and um, thank you for telling me about it, Bruce, because I um, have just been doing the mental check and I realized I listen to talk radio or in, uh, classical music without uh, uh, words. And oh. um, I'm going to start uh, using more uh, with uh, the words. And uh, after three months, I'm uh, going to find out maybe it uh, helps. Well, hopefully it will. Yeah. Take Roth's approach. Listen to the Photops or the Temptations or the Supremes. Awesome. Absolutely. And, uh, and um, it's a interesting... selections. What's that? Very good selections. Yeah. Uh, it's a good listen to. Uh, Why do you say that, Dr. Hetzler? Uh, you like Motown yourself or? Oh, yeah. Say... Well, when I was a, an undergraduate at DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana, they would have groups come in and, uh, play and i saw the temptations and the four tops there wow and i loved them uh, they were great well we're the same age so you know like i said earlier i i grew up on that music the other thing i found was it had a really good beat and when you're walking when you got that good downbeat you can always hit that downbeat with your affected leg um, and the thing that i found about you know, music in terms of walking was that the music kind of Help strip that overthinking that caught what Brian calls a cognitive overlay. All of us are stroke survivors, you know, when we go to walk, we think about walking we, and we use part of our brain thinking about how terrible we're walking or walking instead of just instead of walking. So my walking was uh, better uh, even after all a number of years because the music took me outside of that whole um uh, overthinking, I call it. He called Brian called it uh, cognitive overlay. It's when you overlay oh. something. Go ahead, Doctor. Yeah, we're um. You probably know that the ability to sing and understand music is a right hemisphere function, and right. if you have a stroke in the right hemisphere, that can produce problems with the prosody of your speech. Prosody is the melody of your speech. Very fascinating. So, you know, uh, you can determine oftentimes the meaning of a sentence by its prosody. Hmm. A question will use one sort of intonation or demand another. And if you have a stroke in the right hemisphere right frontal lobe 
you can get what's called motor aprosodia, hmm. where you cannot change the inflection of a sentence based on what you want to say. But, uh, on the other hand, if you have a stroke in the yeah. right temporal lobe, sort of the mirror image of Wernicke's area, you get sensory aprosodia, where you can't understand the prosody of another's speech. Hmm. Wow. So you can well, hear it, but you cannot uh, understand it. Right. Until you, uh, hopefully, they can relearn uh, the cues, uh, what they mean. Well, that, that's the hope, yes. I'm not aware of any therapy on that because, again, the uh, expressive and motor aphasia is much more obvious and is, is much more serious in terms of your ability to hold a job and so on. So, and, um, I don't know. A, uh, yeah. Um, it's a interesting because um, I uh, always uh, uh, look at uh, as uh, I'm going to be a, a study of one patient instead of, of course, uh, when they publish uh, studies, they always have hundreds or thousands or uh, people. Uh, they're trying to uh, uh, tease out uh, what's significant about uh, what they're doing. But it's really fascinating when we think about it. Um, the blind study is the uh, gold standard, so to speak. But there's so many factors in, that affect us every day. So for example, they don't, uh, um, they don't control for the bar barometric uh, pressure, do they? Uh, maybe uh, it is a, a person in France is compared to one in the United States. They don't, don't uh, realize maybe weather has a difference. Uh, um, so there's a lot of factors that can uh, influence all of us. And um, so I uh, compare myself uh, as a, I say N equals one. My uh, study is uh, only one person. And I look at how I, um, how I do something. Uh, and then I look at uh, three months or six months later and I say, I did the this new thing, is it making any difference? So sure. um, I will do the uh, um, the songs with words. I think that's good. And you know, a study on one person can be very informative. Paul Broca, in his first publication, um, was dealing with one patient of his, whom we called Tan, because that was the only word that patient could say, tan. Wow. He had, a, I believe, a cyst in what we now call uh, Broca's area. And when that patient died, Paul Broca got his brain and was able to publish pictures of it showing the location that caused his inability to talk. Wow. Um, now, it, it's interesting because uh, there was a case of Phineas Gage. You may not be familiar with him, but he was a railroad foreman oh, yes. in the 1800s. And it was in charge of a, a blasting crew that was blasting boulders out of the way so they could put down new railroad tracks. And there was one errant explosion that drove a six-foot-long metal bar right through his skull. Let's see, I think it entered on the left side, sort of came out the top of his brain, and uh, the bar just went flying through there, and uh, it changed his personality completely. But he didn't die, but he was no longer able to hold a job the only job he had of sorts was in P.T. Barnum's sideshow where he would sit with his bar. Now his doctor, John Harlow, wrote a paper speculating 
that his personality change was caused by damage to his uh, uh, both sides of his prefrontal cortex. The problem was uh, Phineas Gage died without John Harlow's knowing and was buried along with his bar. Jeez. And so it, John Harlow's uh, writing was pretty much ignored because he didn't have Phineas Gage's brain. So oh. poor John Harlow was going, if I only had a brain. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But but there was an article published, oh God, I don't know, maybe in the, uh, I'm going to guess sometime in the 1980s. I read the original article and um, the bar and Phineas Gage's skull are housed at Harvard University now. And in that article, which was called The Return of Phineas Gage, there was a computerized image of the bar going through his brain showing what it likely damaged. And it was both of the, both lobes of the prefrontal cortex. And it basically shows that Harlow was correct in his speculation. Wow. Mm. Amazing. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit. Um, often uh, I um, find that, uh, especially when I'm uh, out in the public, so to speak, so um, people can see uh, there may be a, uh, is something about me that's different because I'm a, uh, um, it's a, it can be apparent that I have a disabled, a disability um, because I'm uh, holding my uh, right side, uh, uh, my arm still, uh, still is not um, cooperating. And um, sometimes I will find that people uh, revert to uh, talking with the, like they, I'm a kid. And they will talk with me really um, um, simply, or um, um, like a, like a child, like a young child, because I think they forget that intelligence is different from our ability to speak. And uh, I imagine that many of uh, many of you here probably have experienced it uh, too. Oh, absolutely. Now, I've mentioned that I never had a, a speech problem because of my stroke, but I did have to take an eight-hour neuropsychological test before I could return to teaching at Lawrence University. And huh. I passed that with flying colors, and the provost said, yeah, that's great. Uh, welcome back. Jeez. But, the, you know, I couldn't just go resume my position without passing this test that's crazy people too often um they don't they don't understand um especially with aphasia or any type of language disorder that 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 your cognitive skills could be absolutely what what they were uh what they always were uh it's interesting because with all the damage done, a lot of people have issues with short-term memory and brain fog and things like that. But, and I suppose there are people out there that have real serious cognitive issues, but most everybody escapes uh, a lot of the cognitive stuff. I wanted to ask you, uh, Brent, if you knew or you worked with, sorry, I unplugged my computer there, um, uh, Dr. Tom Broussard. Uh, Go the ahead no. Well, I need to put the two of you together because uh, he's trying to bring awareness about uh, aphasia. Uh, what are some things that I know that I could quote? Well, first of all, he's got a little um, uh, little thing that uh, you put on your uh, little, uh, screen of your car. Things that blocks the sun. So if you get stopped by the police or something, it flips down and says, I have aphasia, you know, there's nothing wrong with me, that kind of thing. It's also trying to get aphasia into the lexicon of the hospitals. Something like 70 or 80% of all hospitals don't mention the word aphasia in their post-stroke uh, materials that they hand out. Yes. Wow. It, Tom's uh, quite the advocate. He spent 
Well, he, I mean, he's like me. He works, you know, uh, full time on his work, and he does a lot of uh, in person appearances. I will definitely put the two of you together. Excellent. Um, he's also a great guy. He's also uh, so we'll, I'll make sure to, to do that. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, like you did a minute ago, and that is, um, you know, you were talking about the uh, when you, in the very beginning about the whole you had to learn about the whole concept of recovery. Well, one of the important things that people have, one of the most important things about recovery is attitude. So I would suspect that in your coaching, you quickly discovered that one of the most important things to help people over is that they're not going back to their old self and, and that kind of thinking. Talk a little bit about how you found attitude um, affects people's uh, recovery um, in the work that you're doing, coaching and helping them? Uh, it's a, it's essential. Um, in fact, uh, I've noticed uh, a lot of people when I'm uh, um, talking with them, either they are uh, stroke uh, survivors or they're not, they will often talk about um, their something let's say the people are talking about their stroke but um i uh, have found that uh with our words we will determine our outcome so uh if we always talk about my stroke we um have a, a real personal experience with our the stroke and uh it almost is part of our identity and um one of the things I want to um, do is have people look at uh, their words that they use. And if they're always referring to my stroke, uh, it um, is harder to um, distance them because um, um, when they th their identity is so important um, that... Uh, it determines what we are going to become. So if everybody is always talking about my stroke, it's harder to get beyond it and look at uh, the new things that uh, are coming down the road to them. Yeah, I've seen a number of people who uh, approved a post the other day with somebody talking about it. it's not my stroke, it's the stroke. Um, I agreed with the what he got to after that i don't uh, well i shouldn't say i don't get hung up in language because i tell people who use the word victim i usually refer to it as the v word like you know like it's an f-bomb or something because it is because i think if you um you know if you think of yourself it's the same sort of thinking if you think of yourself if you refer to yourself as a victim Aren't you? Are you more likely to be one? Uh, mm -hmm. our, our thinking very much influences um, our outlook and therefore outcomes. So, other, if it didn't, uh, things like mindfulness wouldn't work, would it? Yes. Yes. Do you um, yes. do you practice or preach any mindfulness in your? Um, yes, I do. Uh, um, but back to your uh, point, I uh, make. Um, a distinction between three groups uh, uh, have the which uh, experience the stroke. They are victims, and I imagine uh, they're uh, like uh, somebody. It's like a we're all on a, a cruise ship, and it sinks, um, and uh, three groups uh, emerge. The victims are people that look around and they say, "I'm going to die," and they slowly uh, uh, get tired and die. And then I, uh, the next group is survivors. And uh, they look around and they decide, well, I'm going to, uh, it happened, but uh, I'm going to deal with uh, as best I can. And they tread water and, uh, until they eventually run out of steam. And the third group, which I call thrivers, and uh, they look around and they see a light in the distance and they figure, I don't know what it is, but I'm. It's better than where I am now, so I'm going to start swimming. And um, thrivers, uh, I think, take uh, take their um, 
uh, their life into their hands and they start to do something about it. Well, and then there's the whole thing about, you know, anniversaries. A lot of people are anti-anniversaries and they, they think those of us that I celebrated mine. I had, I was told that they're difficult at six months and guess what? I had a difficult time with it because my therapist I was talking to was going through something that coincided when well, she'd gotten divorced sick, right around the time I had my stroke. And so she kept telling me that um, anniversaries are tough. And I had a tough six month anniversary because again, I, you know, I let that language influence my thinking. And at a year I decided it was a celebration. I should be celebrating I'm still alive. And the people that are tend to be anti and so I'm not celebrating that thing. Um, tend to, um, well, y y you can't look at it as a loss. We're not celebrating the stroke itself and the deficits. We're celebrating the fact that we're still alive. Dr. Hetzler and I both had a stroke, a uh, hemorrhagic stroke to the our right thalamus. And about 40% of the people die that day and 10% in the next week or so. And uh, I've learned all kinds of horrible things. He and I both could be blind, but we, we didn't hit that area. So it's that not a matter true. of celebrating the stroke. It's a matter of celebrating still being alive. And I wrote a thing. I'll, I'll, let's talk just a sec, Dr. Hessler. I wrote a thing in one year where I said, you know, you have to look at... Um, the fact that you are still alive when you think about the things that you can't do instead of the things that you can do you turn it into a loss and so it, this whole thing is really the most difficult thing in stroke recovery because so many people dr hetzel will tell you neuroplasticity lasts a lifetime he'll also tell you something uh called spontaneous healing that occurs for six months to a year it's why the doctor's some doctors say that's all you'll get. So it's real important for newbies to somehow flip the you know the tables on that whole thing and 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 get down to to recovery business because they're as we used to say in the film business we're burning daylight they're burning neuroplasticity. Um, so Dr. Hetzler, you had something. Well, yes, I was going to say, and sort of agrees with what you said, uh, the night of my stroke, uh, the attending neurologist told my wife that I would probably not be alive the next morning. And uh, here it is 12 years later, and I'm still alive. So I yeah. guess that neurologist was wrong. Yeah. And I, I suspect many of the doctors, uh, the, the physicians, uh say it with the worst case scenario is because they figure if you do better than that they are the heroes i don't um, know they must because if you read the posts they must use the word massive because about 99 and 44 one hundredths that's the percentage of ivory so um 99 44 one hundredths of stroke survivors always include the word massive and I would say about 90% of them say, you know, I was supposed to die. I, you know, they told my family I wouldn't live. And, um, you, and I don't think people are exaggerating what they heard. But the, the, those are two things that I noticed. There's always, uh, I'm not supposed to be here. And uh, you always use the word massive. So, yes. Uh, well, I don't, I, use the term, I don't use the term massive. Um but uh, when I first saw my uh, primary care physician after I got out of the various hospitals and so on, he told me that when he first saw a CT scan of my brain, he assumed I had died. And, well, he was wrong, too. <laughs> Great. Well, but, I don't I know. Brent, um, we need to, uh, we've got sure. about five more minutes, so just, just give him the five-minute warning like we do okay. in... You know, a lot of times we just hold up our hands, however many fingers are left. Well, your wife's sure. a producer. You understand this. Yes. Anyway, In five um, minutes, you know, you can go like this. <laughs> right. You know, that, that originally meant that was a Roman soldier ordering five beers. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Roman number <laughs> five. You get it? Right. Yes, I get it. Well, uh, yeah. I just want to say 
um, um, when I am looking at uh, um, recovering, it really means uh, the community and support are key for all of us. And I'm so happy that um, uh, you, all you guys, uh, you, I, I'm, uh, anyways, um, you get together regularly. And that's so wonderful because when you share your experience, you strengthen each other. And um, I'm uh, um, so happy that uh, you do this because it uh, means it means everything because I know there's a lot of people who had the stroke who are not really taking advantage of uh, the community. And um, with the it, with their com the computer or tablet or phone, they mean that it's easy to get uh, connected to others. And um, it's so wonderful that you uh, uh, keep active uh, and help others um, be in community, be connected. Well, you're you're one of what I would call a pay it forward stroke survivor. And if you may not have big communal meetings, but both Dr. Hetzler and I have appeared on in interviews with you. So you're trying to, you know, bring knowledge to people. You're trying to engage them. That that's a, a form of community. We're social creatures. So they told me five things to do when I went home from the hospital. I already did all of them because I was a vegetarian. I'd, exercise whatever but one of them they said was really important was um you can't sit around at home you have to in engage because we're we're social creatures we used to live in little packs of 30 and 40 and pick the fleas off each other uh, <laughs> no it's true uh, well i don't have fleas ralph but maybe you do <laughs> no i don't no uh i don't have all that fur anymore either <laughs> it's called evolution but you know we come from uh you know uh communal pack living and and a, a lot of our responses are are, are in life are, are based on that we need feedback uh so uh one thing i'll make sure to do is not only connect you with dr Broussard, but also get your information and post it um in the description under this video so people who want to reach out to you and your community um can do so because you're doing good things um there and i've been surprised how many people who have a stroke in the beginning i started doing this about eight years ago well, when i had my stroke 16 years ago i looked around for like a mentor or somebody there, there was nobody i people ask me why i do this i say i'm trying to be the person that i wish i could have talked to right after I had my stroke, but they didn't exist. And I started doing this about eight years ago, helping folks. And, uh, well, there weren't a whole lot of it going on then. There's more and more now. And I've been surprised that uh, I'd say 25, 30, 40% of, of stroke survivors in some way or another want to make it easier on the next person. And that's a wonderful thing. And that's what these groups are all about. That's what you were pointing out there that, you know, um, even if it's anecdotal, knowledge is power. Uh, and you can always, you know, check with your doctors and, and everything. But some things doctors don't know. Um, we know some things that doctors don't know because we've had uh, we've had the stroke. Uh, so I guess we should let you go. Uh, but um, the other thing I, I think is really important uh, um, is... Um, when you um, you talked about uh, your social uh, creatures, um, um, I think that um, it's great that uh, social media has uh, expanded to allow us to be social creatures. And like um, way last June, I decided I was going to post a reel every day, and I've almost have, have succeeded, and I'm going to do it at least a year. And I'm just, uh, I tell what's on my mind or what's on my heart. And um, people uh, appreciate that. I've listened to a number of them. They're, they're heartfelt and informative. What, what else can you ask for? 
Um, <laughs> people like other stroke survivors identify with uh, all of us, what I call pay it forward. Well, with anybody, but particularly with the pay it forward types that put out some kind of media because they can they can tell it's real. They can tell that that's somebody who understands. And that's the connection I'm talking about in terms of so social um uh, us, us being social creatures. So, you know, we need, need to engage with a non-stroke community, but engaging with the stroke community is also a good thing because, you know, you're surrounded by people who understand, people who yes. have maybe been through pretty much the same thing as you. Yes. So. Well, it was wonderful to uh, uh, come together and uh, have this chance to share some uh, stories and uh, experiences. And I, I will hope that we uh, will do it again. I we hope so. I'm talking to you. <laughs> Thank you. See ya. Thank you, sir. Thank Goodbye. you. All right. Bye, Bye. Brian. Do all you can with what you have in the time you have in the place you are. Do all you can. Do all you can.